We have two scripture readings this morning. The first is from Exodus chapter 24, from verse 1 to 8. Exodus 24, from the first verse. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, and Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And then we turn to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 17. But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11 have been the cause of much debate and confusion in the church. And so as we begin today, we need firstly to put things into their historical context in order to try and understand what Paul was really talking about before we try to apply these words to ourselves. The background to this was that Corinth was an old Greek city. It was one of the, the largest commercial cities of its time. And it was an important trading center because of its location in ancient Greece. It was the place to be for the rich and famous. It was an affluent city and status was very important in Corinth. And as a result of this, many of the problems that they experienced in the church in Corinth were because of the, the personal struggles and the issues which had to do with status and importance. People took it from their social lives and then brought it into the church, which created all kinds of issues. And that's why Paul said that their meetings did more harm than good. Now, of course, every church has its issues. Whenever you put a bunch of sinners together, you're guaranteed to have fireworks. But the Corinthian church was seriously divided. It started out as a house church. In fact, a series of house churches and like most of the early congregations of those days, they would celebrate the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion each week. But what had happened was that these meals had degenerated to the point where they were really no different from any other meal. What had happened was they had forgotten the significance of the Lord's Supper, which is one of the reasons that Paul wrote to them and was critical of them. Because status and importance would dictate who ate, when they ate, and where they would eat. The rich people were in a special room, and the poor were not allowed in. 
Even at the same table, people were served different food based on their status. If you were rich and you had high status, you would get the choice foods. And the poor were given not much more than leftovers. The rich and the famous were even meeting beforehand, gorging themselves and actually even getting drunk. And the poor would only be allowed in later. And that's why in verse 20, Paul says they weren't even eating the Lord's Supper. This was meant to be a common meal, which was shared by everyone in the church. But the Corinthians had missed the entire point by treating it like any other meal. And they had divided the people up by class. And in so doing, they were humiliating the poor. So one of the reasons that Paul wrote to this church was to remind them of what Holy Communion was really meant to be. And he needed to remind them of the basics. They had forgotten what the Lord's Supper was. And so he takes them firstly back to the Last Supper, the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night before he was crucified. Now I would hope that we're not as divided and as confused as the Corinthian church but there's always the danger that we can lose sight of the deeper spiritual message of the sacrament, particularly when we do it on a regular basis. So just what is Holy Communion? Firstly, it's a memorial. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the Reformed Church, we don't believe that the bread and wine literally turn into the body and the blood of Jesus. The theological term for that is transubstantiation. There's a simple analogy which helps to explain the reformed belief of Holy Communion, and that, and that is a photograph. I can show you a picture of myself and say, this is me, but you'll know that it's not really me. It's just a picture of myself on a piece of paper. It's a representation of the real person. And in much the same way, the, the, we believe that the bread does not literally and magically turn into Jesus' body. Jesus' disciples were not confused when he said, this is my body and this is my blood. They understood what he was talking about because he was talking in symbolic terms. Now, on the other hand, there are some Christian churches who believe that the bread and the wine remain nothing more than simple bread and wine. The elements which are used at a communion service are there to remind us of Jesus and what he did. But the elements themselves hold no deep spiritual significance. And their understanding is that there's nothing important or symbolic about the bread of wine. We're just doing this in order to remember. And the Reformed Church fits somewhere in between these two points of view. The bread and the wine don't literally turn into the flesh and blood of Christ. But at the same time, it's not just bread and wine. We believe there's a much deeper significance in what the elements mean to us. Now, in a few moments you'll be eating a small wafer and drinking a small glass of grape juice. But it's going to mean so much more than that. What you're going to be doing when you come to the table is that you will be publicly proclaiming that you are in a living covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And by faith, you will, you will be making a direct connection between this sacrament and what happened at Calvary. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? A key word here is participation. It is by his literal body which was nailed to the cross and his literal actual blood which was shed for us that we are saved. And we somehow participate in that when we take communion. Now, we were not there at Calvary. So how do we make sense of these words? How do we participate in the body and the blood of Christ? Galatians 2 verse 20 will help us here. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now we were not literally crucified with Christ. But in, not in a, in a literal sense. But by partaking in the sacrament of Holy Communion, we are binding ourselves to him and what he did for us by faith. So when we celebrate Holy Communion, we do this in remembrance of Jesus' death and resurrection. 
It's a memorial. It's not just a cerebral action. It's not just something which happens in our minds, but rather something that we do with our whole being. It's a physical and it's a spiritual thing. And that's what makes the bread and the wine more than just bread or wine. There's a Canadian theologian by the name of Gordon Smith who wrote a book called A Holy Meal. And in, in it he writes this. We need to come to the table regularly when we feel like it and when we don't. For the great danger is that we would forget. We can so easily forget. I do not mean that we no longer recall or believe that something happened. Rather, our forgetting is one of no longer living aligned with the reality and wonder of Christ's death and resurrection. We can fail to live in the light of this ancient event. So easily through neglect, the cross and the resurrection no longer penetrate our present, enabling us to live in the light of the gospel. And I think he has the right balance there. It's not just something that we do because we do it on the first Sunday of every month, but we need to remember exactly why we are coming to the table. And so the first point is that Holy Communion is a memorial. Secondly, it is fellowship. Jesus is not just an historical figure who died 2,000 or so years ago, who we remember by eating bread and drinking wine or, or grape juice. He is alive, and by his Spirit, he is present when we celebrate the sacrament. It's one of the reasons that we use the word communion. We are in communion with one another, and we are in communion with him. And this is part of the issue that the Corinthian church was facing. They weren't celebrating this meal properly because they were no longer in communion with one another. They weren't looking at each other, at each other and saying, we are one. Christ has made us one. In verse 29, again, remembering that Paul was writing to the, the, to the Corinthian church, he said, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's on the ESV, the English Standard Version. This is one of the verses which has caused so much confusion. The New King James Version says, He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And this again points us to the significance of Holy Communion and what those elements of bread and wine represent. Now, it's quite different for us today because we, we don't eat a full meal like in the days of the Corinthian church. But the principle still applies. When Christians don't properly appreciate the significance, in fact, the holiness of celebrating communion, in effect, we are treating with indifference the Lord himself. Then we are doing it in an unworthy manner because we are now trivializing or diminishing the significance of his life, his suffering and his death. And also, because the sacrament is a communal meal, we shouldn't be doing this while we have issues with one another. Now, this needs some clarification, too. I'm a sinner, and so are you. And that means that our relationship can never be perfect. Our love for each other will never measure up to God's standards. So, now, does that mean that we should not have Holy Communion together? No, because we must remember the grace of God. If perfect harmony in human relationships were a prerequisite for Holy Communion... Jesus would not have given us this meal in the first place. Yet he gave us the sacrament, knowing full well that the church will always have issues among its members. But he would not have commanded us to do this in remembrance of him if we were not worthy enough to come to the table. But our worth is in him, not in ourselves. And that is the key to understanding Paul's statement in verse 29. It's about Jesus and about who he is more than it is about us. However, Paul also says in Romans 12 verse 18, which was another letter to another church, he said, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So yes, there is an obligation on our part to have a sense of community, especially when we share in Holy Communion. We are duty and honor bound to make an effort as far as is humanly possible with the Lord's help to resolve personal issues and conflicts in the church. So this is a memorial and it's also a time of fellowship where we come together. Thirdly, Holy Communion is a covenant renewal ceremony. 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. What Jesus is saying here is that his blood, his sacrifice, replaces the old covenant which was given to Moses in Exodus chapter 24. It's also that this new covenant that Jeremiah wrote about in chapter 31 when God said he would write the law on our hearts. All covenants are represented and remembered through symbolic acts. And in the Old Testament, it usually involved animal sacrifice. Part of the animal would be sacrificed by being burnt on an altar, and part of it would be eaten in, in a covenant meal. And in the new covenant, Jesus is both a sacrifice and the one that we are in covenant with. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul calls Jesus the Passover lamb who has been sacrificed. So when we come to the table to share in Holy Communion, we remember the covenant that God has made with us and we respond in faith to him as we renew that covenant with him. This is a place where we are reminded of the mercy and the forgiveness that we have in Christ. The forgiveness for all of the ways that we have not lived up to the kind of people that we should be. And we declare our intention to renew the covenant. Remember that the sacrifice of Jesus is a once-off, never-to-be-repeated sacrifice. God keeps his covenant promises. And he doesn't need to renew them. Nor does he need to be reminded of them. But we do. And that's one of the reasons we need to come to the table on a regular basis. It's a place to refresh and to renew our commitment to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And the final point is that Holy Communion is a declaration of thanksgiving and of hope. Eucharist is another word which is sometimes used for the sacrament. And that Eucharist comes from the Greek word for thanksgiving. So when we celebrate communion or the Eucharist, it really is a celebration. Jesus gave thanks and so should we. We give thanks to God for giving us life, for offering us forgiveness. We give thanks to Jesus for paying the price of our sin. And we also give thanks for the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives within us to comfort us and to guide us through life. We're also reminded at the table of the hope that we have. In verse 26, Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this meal doesn't just look back at the Last Supper that Jesus, Jesus shared with his disciples. It also looks forward to another meal which Jesus will eat with us in glory. In Revelation chapter 19, it's called the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. So we look back in thankfulness, but we also look forward in hope. None of us can pretend to fully understand the mysteries of God, and included in that list is Holy Communion. We are all different, and, and God meets us, and he ministers to us in different ways as, as we share the sacrament. It's about us as his family, but it's also a deeply personal thing that we do. And before we close, I want to go back to a couple of those phrases in 1 Corinthians 11, which have created confusion and even division in the church. Verse 27 says we shouldn't do this in an unworthy manner. Now, we've already touched on this. Many believe that these words mean that just because they are sinful, they shouldn't take communion at all. But again, we need to look at the historical context. We need to look at what, what Paul was writing about and who he was writing to. What he warned, when he warns the Corinthians against taking communion in an unworthy manner, he was telling them that they shouldn't abuse it, which is something they had been doing. Based on their status in society, they had been applying worldly standards to decide who could and who couldn't take communion. And that's what made it unworthy. That was unworthy of the grace of God. It was unworthy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Verse 28, examine yourself. That doesn't mean that you must make sure that you don't have any sin. We come to the Lord's table to be reminded of the mercy that we've received. And if we waited until we were without sin, we would never come. Remember that Jesus is the host at this table. And Jesus ate with sinners. He welcomes us to the table in the same way that he welcomed and ate with sinners in his day. The same way that he welcomed and forgave Peter for his denial. 
So examine yourself doesn't mean that you must make sure that you don't, that you don't have any sin. Rather, it means to examine your heart, recognize your sin, recognize your need for grace, and then come to the table knowing that Jesus is the source of the grace and the forgiveness that you need. Remember the power of the gospel of Christ, which has set you free. Another way of putting it is this. It's when you think that you are least worthy to come to the table to take Holy Communion that you need it the most. Remember that God loves you, and he would not have sent Jesus to the cross had he thought you were not worth saving. But he did, because you are worth saving. The Lord's table is a place of mercy where you are reminded of what God has done for you, what he has promised to you. But it's not just about you. It's not even just about you and Jesus. It's about the body of Christ. It's about the church coming together to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is not just any meal. It is the meal where we declare that we are one in Christ. As we know, the church is not a club of like-minded people just coming together. There are many organizations like that. The church is very different to a sports or a social club. We are, or at least we should be, a diverse group of people who are gathered around Jesus Christ because we have him in common. It is he who draws us together. That's why, as far as depends on us, there should be no divisions at the table. It's when we start thinking of ourselves as better than others that we are in danger of eating and drinking judgment on ourselves. So this is a place to remember. It's a place to gather together. It's a place to renew our commitment to Christ. And it's a place to be reminded of what God has prepared for those who love him. It is for you. It is for the people of God that he has drawn together under one umbrella. And that is Jesus Christ. So shall we pray? Father, the first thing we need to do is to confess that we are not worthy to come to the table. For we still struggle with our sin, even though we are redeemed and a forgiven people. But here, Lord, we are reminded of the grace which is sufficient for us. And so we thank you, Lord, that you don't call us to be perfect to come to the table. You call us to trust in Christ. And it is by his blood that we have been set free. It is by his blood that we are redeemed and are clothed in his righteousness. And because of that, you welcome us to the table. You welcome us into this place as the family of God. And for that, Lord, we give you thanks. We bless you, Lord, that you've given us all that we need and so much more to live lives of righteousness and holiness. And we pray that you continue to remind us of the peace that we have with you, all and only through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we give you glory in his name. Amen.